Hey, time for your life's math and history, and we are going to take a look at applications of sinusoidal functions. So this is a pre-calculus video, and what we're going to do is we've been learning about the sine and the cosine waves and how to graph them. But what we're going to do is we are going to now apply it to real life. So in the previous video, we've got an introductory lesson on how to do it. But the problem was, not only we've learned that it was a Ferris wheel, but it was everything at once. So this video is going to be sort of like a part two to kind of understand at a much simpler level what the problems actually are and how they apply to real life. So we don't need to go back to understanding the frequency and the period. Well, to reference it, it's literally right here. The frequency is how many cycles something happens in a given matter of time, and the period is how long it has time to complete exactly one cycle. And these are the formulas right here. So what we're going to do is understand and comprehend the problem. So right over here, we're not going to solve the problem, but kind of draw a graph, but also answer questions that relate to the problem. So a ball is attached to a string, which is stretched and then let go. The height of the ball is given by the sinusoidal equation, which means it reciprocates. Oh yeah, I have a tennis ball right here. So what happens is, assuming that there is a spring attached to the ceiling, yeah, like this one right here, if I attach this tennis ball and I drag it down, it's going to go up and down, up and down every time the spring contracts and stretches. So that is an, that is an example of a sinusoidal application. The, but the question where mathematicians love to use is literally stuff that they like to analyze with. y equals 3.5 cosine parentheses 4 pi divided by 5 x plus 5. Where y represents the height above the ground in feet the ball is at, and x represents the number of time, or the number of seconds, happen right after I release the ball. So, what we're going to do is try to make a graph, but also answer questions right over here. Oh, and yeah, the questions are right over here. So going back over here, let's get started. So right over here, we're going to put 5 feet right over here at the midline. But you might be asking, why the midline? Well, that is the neutral point of where you hold the ball 5 meters above the ground. When you pull it down, that is going to create a negative distance. The spring is going to create energy. So what happens is 5, you have to pull it down. Wait, before we do that, we have to write the equation. y equals 3.5 cosine parentheses 4 pi divide that by 5. x parentheses plus 5. So the reason why we had to write it down first is not only give us a model, but take a look over here, the 3.5. That is the amplitude of what the wave on the graph is going to look like. But also, that's the distance of how much far, in terms of meters, the ball is going to go up and down and back up and back down. So when we pull the ball and we stretch it to go down, we have to subtract this number by 3.5, which is 1.5. So as you pull the ball down, is 1.5. Then you got to release it. But once it goes up, you have to do 3.5 plus the 5. And when you do that, you are going to get an answer of 8.5. So here is what's going to happen. We know the minimum, we know the midline, and we know the maximum height. So what we're going to do is answer some questions. So right over here are the questions. What height of the ball was it when it was released? It's not 5 meters because you can't hold the ball. You have to charge it with energy so the spring can stretch at 1.5 meters. What was the maximum height? I said originally 12 meters, but instead 
is 8.5 because that is the maximum the graph has. The reason why I had these earlier numbers is because when the problem said 5 feet off the ground, I literally meant that the 5 feet was the minimum. But what was really happening was the 5 feet is actually the midline. So this one right here, that, that graph was incorrect. Now, let's find out how many seconds does it take for the bulb to return to the original position. So that is the actual problem that we're trying to solve. But before we understand how we do that, we know from the last video that it has to do something with the frequency and the period. So the frequency is how many cycles happen in a matter of time, and period is how long to complete one cycle. And since we're playing around with a, a cosine wave, and it's telling us how many seconds does it take for the bulb to complete one cycle, then we must use the period. And the formula for the period is P equals frequency divided by 1. So going back over here, what is going to be the period? Well, if you take a look at the 4 pi divided by pi, 4 pi divided by 5x, that is going to be the x value, and that also is going to be in seconds. But the problem is, we have 4 pi divided by 5 as x, where x represents the number of seconds. We're trying to find how many seconds does it take for the ball to go up and back down. So right over here, we're going to place... 4 pi divided by 5 as the period. Mathematicians don't really like pi as an exact answer because it's just not really the right thing to do. But also, it doesn't really give you an exact number. So we have to somehow transform it into a way where we can change it so we can find the actual number of seconds. If you remember from the previous video, where we handle numbers that are in front of the x value in this formula right here, we can use the formula 2 pi divided by b. And what happens here is with 2 pi divided by 4 pi divided by b, that isn't really an easy thing to do. So to get it into another way of thinking about it, or to transform it into a more comprehensible way, you have to do 5 divided by 4 pi, and then 5 divided by 4 pi on the top. So these two are going to cancel out and turn into the number 1. And when you do 2 pi times 5, you get 10 pi. And 1 times 4 pi is going to be just 4 pi. So the 1 we don't need because you're dividing by 1. So 10 pi divided by 4 pi it's going to be 5 over 2 because the pi's cancel out. So we know that 5 divided by 2 is going to be how many seconds for the ball to go down, back up, and back down again. So since that is going to be the period in seconds, that is also going to be where the sine, not the sine, the cosine wave ends at 5 divided by 2 seconds. Your math teacher, if she wants you to, if she or he wants you to graph it, is going to ask you to put five points on the graph. The zero and the five count as two points. But what are the other points? Five divided by two, if you cut that in half, you get five divided by four. And if you cut that in half again, you get five divided by eight. So technically, the sine, not, why am I saying the sine wave? The cosine wave is actually doing the work for you. But what about this one right here? You can't really do 5 divided by 3 because it's not exactly half between this and that. What we can do though is we can turn it into 15 divided by 8. Because if we can transform the 5 divided by 2 and then we can somehow turn it into a fraction where you can multiply it by one half or something, not one half. If we do 5 divided by 2 multiplied by 3 over 4, we get 15 over 8. The reason why we chose 3 over 4 is because it looks like it's 3 fourths of the way there. 
from here to here is 3 fourths, while here to here is 1. So 15 divided by 8. Now we have the chance to actually graph it. Going from the pictures from the previous videos, we can say that right over here is the cosine wave, where you start at the top, then go back down, and go back to the top again. So going back here, we found out that, hey, guess what? We forgot to tell you that there was supposed to be a negative sign right here in front of the 3.5. That does not alter or change the mathematics, but what it actually does is everything here is the same. The time and the seconds are the same. The vectors are also the same. But what it really changes is when the graph starts. So right over here is a positive cosine, where at the top of the y, we have a 1. But the opposite is where you have a negative 1. So here is what's going to happen, right over here. We start at 0, which represents the 1.5 meters we did to stretch the spring down. Then it crosses the 5 divided by 8, then, what happens is it goes above to 8.5, which is the maximum, then quickly goes back down to go to where it used to be at 5 divided by 2 seconds soon after. I'm sorry to forget to write the negative, because if it was a positive, it wouldn't make sense to have the ball when you try to raise it above, then you go back down, back down, up. It's still the same kind of physics. But the thing is, the negative, nothing changes but where the graph is going to go. And the mistake, we actually did that because these kind of problems require you to go slowly, but also to analyze every little detail, the work you do, the calculations you do, and the symbols that you read and comprehend. So we have did it. We have learned how to use applications of sinusoidal functions. I hope this video has helped you understand applications of sinusoidal functions. Thank you for watching Taoping Airlines the Math Industry. Like and subscribe.